In this series, we're going to spend some time with one of the more neglected of the Reformers. When you talk about the Reformation, there are several names that come immediately to mind. Martin Luther and John Calvin foremost among them. But it's, uh, if Melanchthon's name comes up at all, it's usually very far down on the list. Even among Lutherans, uh, Melanchthon is often either ignored or, or brushed over very quickly for reasons that we'll explore later. Notice what Robert Godfrey says. Many influential leaders of the Reformation are largely forgotten today. One of those, especially neglected by Reformed people, is Philip Melanchthon, 1497 to 1560. Yet if we had asked Martin Luther in the 1520s who he thought would emerge as the great leader of the German Reformation, he would certainly have answered Melanchthon. He once said on theology, Luther has the content, but not the style. Erasmus has the style, but not the content. Karlstad has neither the content nor the style, but Melanchthon has both the content and the style. And so we come now to explore the life and influence of one of the key figures of the German Reformation, yet one of the most neglected figures of the German Reformation, Philip Melanchthon. One, Melanchthon's life. Philip the Upright served as the elector or Count Palatine of the Rhine region of Germany and the Holy Roman Empire from 1476 to 1508. This was a significant position as he was one of those who elected the Holy Roman em Emperor. Among the staff of the elector Philip was a man who served in a prestigious position as his armorer and lived in Breton. That man was George Schwarzerd. The name means literally Black Earth. His wife's name was Barbara. On the 16th of February, 1497, Barbara gave birth to a son whom they called Philip. In 1507, they sent Philip to study at the Latin school in Forsheim, roughly 10 miles away. There he was introduced to uh, the Latin and Greek poets and to Aristotle. He was also greatly influenced by his great uncle, the Renaissance humanist scholar Johann Ruschlin. As a renowned Hebrew scholar, Ruschlin would also have some influence on Martin Luther, much as Erasmus would influence Luther, though neither Erasmus nor Ruschlin would really be fully considered reformers. It was a common custom at the time for humanist scholars to adopt the Greek form of their name. Thus, Ruschlin was often referred to by the Greek form of his name, Capneon. And he suggested that the young Philip adopt the Greek form of his name, which was Melanchthon. And so Philip Schwarzerd became Philip Melanchthon, as he's been known throughout history. 1508 was a difficult year for Melanchthon, who turned 11 years old in that year. In October of that year, both his grandfather and his father died within 11 days of each other. So he and a brother were sent uh, to live with his maternal grandmother there in Forsheim, Elizabeth Reuter. Elizabeth was the sister of R Johann Ruschlin. Despite these difficulties, Philip did very well in his studies. And in 1509, at the age of 12, he entered the University of Heidelberg, studying philosophy, uh, astronomy, and rhetoric. He, lear he earned his bachelor's degree in just two years but where he really excelled was in the study of Greek. 1512, he was still too young to be granted his master's degree, so he went to study at Turbingen. There, to his other studies, he also added jurisprudence, mathematics, medicine, and theology. He was awarded his master's degree in 1518 at 21 years of age. So at the age of 21, Melanchthon took the position of professor of Greek at the university in Wittenberg. And this was largely due to the influence of his great uncle, Johann Ruschlin. It was just the previous year, 1517, when Martin Luther had posted his 95 theses there in Wittenberg. And the Reformation was, though still in its early days, spreading fast. And Melanchthon was very much caught up in its wake. Like Luther, Melanchthon was convinced that justification 
must be by faith rather than by faith and works. But while both of these Wittenberg men were certainly on the same page in terms of their Reformation theology, their personalities, styles, and methods were quite different. In this, they were the perfect complement one to the other. David Mathis contrasts them this way. Luther had little concern for precision or guarding against misconception. Melanchthon made nuance his forte. Luther said he used a spear, while Melanchthon used pins and needles. Luther was a pioneer, hacking his way through centuries of superstitious brush with an apostolic machete. But Melanchthon, like Bullinger in Zurich and Calvin in Geneva, played the part of the calm, collected systematic, grading the Protestant faith for generations to come. He was the quiet reformer and a fitting complement to the loud, boisterous Luther. It did not take long for Luther and Melanchthon to become friends and co-laborers in this great work of the Reformation. When Melanchthon arrived in Wittenberg, he rented a simple house where he lived with his assistant, Johannes Koch. The men lived very frugally, and Melanchthon's health was not very strong. So Martin Luther was concerned about his friend and decided that what Philip needed was a wife. Now, Luther had already found wives for quite a few reformed ministers, and he set about to find one for Melanchthon. One of the leading families in Wittenberg was the Kropp family. Hans Kropp was a tailor by trade and also served as the mayor of Wittenberg. He had a daughter named Katharina. Luther felt that she would be a good match for Philip, and so he managed to get them together. They were married on the 27th of November, 1520, and had a very happy life together. They had four children, Anna, Philip, George, who sadly died at the age of three, and Magdalene. Philip Schaff tells us that he could often be seen rocking the cradle with one hand while holding a book in the other. They also took in Katharina's uh, niece, Anna Munsterer, when her parents died of the plague in 1539. <clears throat> Philip Schaff gives us a little glimpse into Melanchthon's home life there in Wittenberg. It says, his fame attracted students from all parts of Christendom, including princes, counts, and barons. His lecture room was crowded to overflowing, and he heard occasionally as many as 11 languages at his frugal but hospitable table. He received calls to Turbingen, Nuremberg, and Heidelberg, and was also invited to Denmark, France, and England but he preferred remaining in Wittenberg till his death. Katharina's health was somewhat problematic. She suffered most likely from chronic liver disease, the symptoms of which first became apparent in 1536. She lived with the disease for the next 21 years, tirelessly caring for her family. She finally reached the end of her journey on the 11th of October, 1557. Schaff says, she died in 1557 while he was on a journey to the Colloquy of Worms. When he heard the sad news at Heidelberg, he looked up to heaven and exclaimed, Farewell, I shall soon follow thee. Her death was a hard blow for Philip, who loved her greatly. He would only survive her by less than three years. His own health was not the best and he was worn out by his years of tireless labor and all the stresses that he had to undergo. He would caught a cold while on the journey to Leipzig in March of 1560, never could get over the fever. He wrote a note a few days before his death in which he stated his confidence in the Lord and how death held no fears for him. He wrote of what he expected from his approaching death. On one side of the note he wrote, you'll be delivered from sins and be freed from the acrimony and fury of theologians. And on the other side, he wrote, You will go to the light, see God, look upon his Son, learn those wonderful mysteries which you have not been able to understand in this life. And so he passed into the presence of his Lord and Savior on the 19th of April, 1560. Luther had already passed that way 14 years earlier. 2. Melanchthon and Luther 
Once Philip Melanchthon arrived in Wittenberg, it did not take long before he and Martin Luther became good friends. In fact, it's often been said that Melanchthon was Luther's closest friend. The two men were in many ways quite different in personality, temperament, style, and bearing. And so each one was able to contribute to the Reformation in ways that the other one couldn't. Schaff puts it this way, Luther was a man of war, Melanchthon a man of peace. Luther's writings smell of powder. His, works are, his words are battles. He overwhelms his opponents with a roaring cannonade of argument, eloquence, passion, and abuse. Melanchthon excels in moderation and amiability, and often exercised a happy restraint upon the unmeasured violence of his colleague. Luther was the boldest, the most heroic and commanding, Melanchthon the most gentle, pious, and conscientious of the reformers. He felt more keenly and painfully than any other the tremendous responsibility of the great religious movement in which he was engaged. He would have made any personal sacrifice if he could have, if he could have removed the confusion and divisions attendant upon it. On several occasions he showed, no doubt, too much timidity and weakness, but his concessions to the enemy and his disposition to compromise for the sake of peace and unity proceeded always from pure and conscientious motives. The two Wittenberg reformers were brought together by the hand of Providence to supply and complete each other, and by their united talents and energies to carry forward the German Reformation, which would have assumed a very different character if it had been exclusively left in the hands of either of them. Without Luther, the Reformation would never have taken hold of the common people, and without Melanchthon, it would never have succeeded among the scholars of Germany. In the work of God's kingdom and covenant, no one man can do all the work that God has determined to accomplish. Moses could deliver Israel from Egypt and lead them through the wilderness, but Joshua had to be called to bring them into Canaan. David could fight the battles of Jehovah on behalf of God's chosen people, but he could not build the temple. Solomon had to do that. Only Christ can do all the work that needs to be do, needs doing. And in the Reformation, it took many different men to engage in the work, some of greater importance, some of lesser, yet each had his place. And even in those different places in Europe, no man, no one man, could complete all the work. In Geneva, Calvin had Guillaume Farrell to pave the way for him, and Theodore Beza to take the reins after him. In Zurich, Zwingli had the help of Bullinger, and here in Wittenberg, Luther needed the helping hand of Philip Melanchthon. And yet they were not just co-workers, they were also very close friends. Again, Schaff says, The friendship of these two great and good men is one of the most delightful chapters in the religious drama of the 16th century. It rested on mutual personal esteem and hearty German affection, but especially on the consciousness of a providential mission entrusted to their united labors. Although somewhat disturbed at a later period by slight doctrinal differences and occasional ill humor, it lasted to the end, and as they worked together for the same cause, so they now rest under the same roof in the castle church at Wittenberg, at whose doors Luther had nailed the war cry of the Reformation. Immediately after his arrival at the Saxon University on the Elbe, Melanchthon entered into an intimate relation with Luther and became his most useful and influential co-laborer. He looked up to his elder colleague with the veneration of a son, while Luther regarded him as his superior in learning and was not ashamed to sit humbly at his feet. Schaff continues, he attended his exegetical lectures and published them without the author's wish and knowledge for the benefit of the church. Melanchthon declared in April 1520 that he would rather die than be separated from Luther. And in November of the same year, he wrote, Martin's welfare is dearer to me than my own life. Luther was captivated by Melanchthon's first lecture. He admired his scholarship, loved his character, and wrote most enthusiastically about him in confidential letters, lauding him as a prodigy of learning and piety. They were neighbors there, living in Wittenberg, their houses quite close to each other. 
Uh, you can still visit their houses today, though now they're museums. Uh, behind Melanchthon's house was a little garden, which was directly connected with the garden behind Luther's house. We're told that here in these gardens, under the shade of a tree, the two men would sit and talk, exchanging views on the serious and stirring events of the times, unpacking those foundational biblical truths that shaped the Reformation, and encouraging each other in the midst of the difficulties of the great conflict. And their very differences served to complement one another rather than dividing each other. Schaff says this, Luther best understood and expressed the difference of temper and character, and it's one of his noble traits that he did not allow it to interfere with the esteem and admiration for his younger friend and colleague. I prefer the books of Master Philippus to my own, he wrote in 1529. I am rough, boisterous, stormy, and altogether warlike. I am born to fight against innumerable monsters and devils. I must remove stumps and stones, cut away thistles and thorns, and clear the wild forests. But Master Philippus comes along softly and gently, sowing and watering with joy, according to the gifts which God has abundantly bestowed upon him. David Mathis also compared Melanchthon to Luther, and says of Melanchthon, he was the quiet reformer, and a fitting compliment to the loud, boisterous Luther. He was not the kind who started revolutions, but the kind who brought order to the ensuing chaos. His mentor, Martin Luther, was brash, impulsive, and forceful, but Philip Melanchthon was a timid, sober-minded unifier. Luther, by his own admission, was substance without words, while his brilliant young disciple was substance and words. Martin Luther's favorite psalm was Psalm 46. It would form the basis of uh, his most popular hymn. When he'd be in the midst of particularly trying circumstances and facing difficult and dangerous opposition, struggling under the stresses and burdens of the huge work of the Reformation, he used to say to his trusted friend, Philip Melanchthon, Philip, let us sing the 46th Psalm and let the devil do his worst. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Again, Philip Schaff has this to say about the two reformers. Luther was a creative genius and pioneer of new paths. Melanchthon, a profound scholar of untiring industry. The one was emphatically the man for the people, abounding in strong and clear sense, popular eloquence, natural wit, genial humor, intrepid courage, and straightforward honesty. The other was a quiet, considerate, systematic thinker, a man of order, method, and taste, and gained the literary circles for the cause of the Reformation. He's the principal founder of a Protestant theology and the author of the Augsburg Confession, the chief symbol of the Lutheran Church. He very properly represented the evangelical cause in all the theological conferences with the Roman Catholic Party at Augsburg, Speer, Worms, Frankfurt, Ratisbon, where Luther's presence would only have increased the heat of controversy and widened the breach. Though different in temperament, they shared the same Reformation theology. Luther trusted Melanchthon more than any other to represent the interests of the Reformation at those conferences Schaff just mentioned. Yet it would be a mistake to think that Melanchthon was just a carbon copy of Luther. He was not. In fact, he differed from Luther on several points and even more as he grew older, and we'll be examining some of those points later. As David Mathis says, 
Melanchthon's close association with Luther, however, did not mean that all Lutherans embraced him. Even while Luther was still living, some impugned Melanchthon as a corrupter, that he was hijacking Luther's bold movement for something more docile. Meanwhile, many others greatly appreciated Melanchthon's nuance, level head, and theological acumen, and thought he was doing his pioneering friend an invaluable service. Melanchthon was too careful a thinker to agree with Luther on everything, but even as differences emerged, he always thought of himself as Luther's disciple. He was helping his mentor, not rebelling against him, in maturing his theological insights. As Schaff and others freely acknowledge, Melanchthon was the careful, cautious, moderate, pondering thinker, could at times be a little too cautious, too careful, too moderate. Melanchthon was a man who truly feared God, and in the biblical sense of that phrase. What is the fear of God? It is that state in the heart of the believer in which the smile of God is his greatest delight, and the frown of God is his greatest dread. And Melanchthon was in dread of God's frown. He had a great fear of sinning against God. Sometimes that fear of offending God became paralyzing. And this would sometimes in irritate Luther, who realized that there are times when you have to do something. There are times when to do nothing can be just as bad as doing the wrong thing. And you can't let your fears paralyze you. And it was this situation that formed the context of one of Martin Luther's most quoted and most misunderstood lines. Notice what Robert Godfrey says here. It was a response to Philip's tentativeness that Luther made one of his most quoted comments. Philip was so worried about which way to act in a certain situation that he was immobilized. Luther impatiently called him to action, saying, Sin boldly. Luther meant that it was better to do something for God, even at the risk of sinning, than to do nothing for fear of sin. Do something, Philip. Yes, we live in a fallen world, and sometimes you may do the wrong thing, but you have to do something. Yes, Luther and Melanchthon, though quite different, were the closest of friends and worked very well together for the advancement of the Reformation in Germany. 3. Melanchthon's Influence Philip Melanchthon's name is not nearly so well recognized as some other reformers. Just go to the average man on the street and ask him if he can name some of the most influential reformers. Uh, first you'll clarify that you're, you aren't talking about modern political reformers, but men who were instrumental in that great reformation of the church. You'll likely hear someone say Martin Luther. You might hear someone say John Calvin or perhaps John Knox. Uh, depending on the street corner, some might even mention Wycliffe, Huss, or Tyndall. But I suspect you may be standing on that street corner for a long time before you hear someone say, Philip Melanchthon, he was one of the key men of the Reformation. As Robert Godfrey points out, even in that monumental Lutheran seminary in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, Concordia Seminary, their library holds many portraits of significant and influential men through the history of the Lutheran Church. But even there, in their library, there is no portrait of Philip Melanchthon. And indeed, some have referred to Melanchthon as the forgotten reformer. But Melanchthon really was one of the key men of the Reformation, and even Luther himself recognized this. And we'll look at his significant influence in several key areas, education, theology, especially systematic theology, and ecumenism. In the realm of education, this was really where Luther had his first introduction to Melanchthon when he first came to Wittenberg. He hadn't yet really made an impression on Luther until he gave his first introductory lecture at the university, and that lecture was on the subject of education. Notice how Schaff characterizes it. Although yet a youth of 21 years of age, Luther at the time was 35, Melanchthon at once gained the esteem and admiration of his colleagues and hearers in Wittenberg. He was small of stature, 
unprepossessing in his outward appearance, diffident and timid. But his high and noble forehead, his fine blue eyes full of fire, the intellectual expression of his countenance, the courtesy and modesty of his behavior revealed the beauty and strength of his inner man. His learning was undoubted, his moral and religious character above suspicion. His introductory address, which he delivered four days after his arrival, August 24th, on the improvement of the studies of youth, dispelled all fears. It contained the program of his academic teaching and marks an epoch in the history of liberal education in Germany. He desired to lead the youth to the sources of knowledge and by a careful study of the languages to furnish the key for the proper understanding of the scriptures that they might become living members of Christ and enjoy the fruits of his heavenly wisdom. He studied and taught theology not merely for the enrichment of the mind but also and chiefly for the promotion of virtue and piety. So says Philip Schaff. So while Melanchthon was a top-notch academic in the humanist tradition, emphasizing as he did the humanities, the Greek and Latin and Hebrew and literary studies, he was not an academic just for academic's sake. Learning was not an end in itself, but only in so far as it equipped the people of God to live real lives to the glory of God. Schaff goes on. He at first devoted himself to philological pursuits and did more than any of his contemporaries to revive the study of Greek for the promotion of biblical learning and the cause of reformation. He called the ancient languages the swaddling clothes of the Christ child. Luther compared them to the sheath of the sword of a spirit. Melanchthon was master of the ancient languages, Luther master of the German. The former, by his cooperation, secured accuracy to the German Bible, the latter, idiomatic force and poetic beauty. So you can see how it was the Bible that was at the heart of true education. In that sense, his emphasis was quite similar to Zwingli, though staying within the confines of Lutheranism. And in this, Luther was in full agreement. In fact, Luther said, I am afraid that the schools will prove the very gates of hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the Holy Scriptures and engraving them in the hearts of the youth. Now there's a certain potential for confusion here, so we must be clear what we mean. When we say that Melanchthon, like Zwingli, was a humanist, we do not mean the same thing as when we refer to humanists today. A modern secular humanist has ruled out God entirely and sees man as the measure of all things, following the tenets of the humanist manifestos of the mid and latter 20th century. Renaissance humanism was really grounded in the rediscovery of the old Greek manuscripts that had made their way westward after Constantinople was sacked by the Turks in 1453. Before that, the knowledge of Greek had been almost entirely lost in Western Europe. In the north of Europe, this renewal in classical Greek literature led to a new interest in the Greek New Testament documents. And so you have Erasmus of Rotterdam editing what became for many years the standard edition of the Greek New Testament, published in Basel in 1516. While Erasmus was a Renaissance humanist who was also interested in the reform of the church, it was his humanism that was central and his influence for reform was more peripheral. And his interest for reform was not doctrinal, but was rather concerned with the practical abuses of the church. Erasmus' greatest contribution to the Reformation was, in fact, his edition of the Greek New Testament. While interested in correcting abuses of the church, in his doctrine he remained essentially Roman Catholic, firmly holding to his semi-Pelagian theology. Erasmus' motto captured the heart of the Renaissance, ad fontes to the font, that is, uh, to the font or the source of classical learning, those old Greek documents upon which Western civilization was built. But Melanchthon, while also a humanist in the sense that he delighted in the rediscovery of the humanities, he was really much more biblical in his approach than was Erasmus. While Melanchthon had a great appreciation for Erasmus, 
his approach to reform was thoroughly different, and could be summed up just as well by borrowing from the motto of Zwingli, Christum ex fontibus, Christ from the font. That is, it was never enough to just go back to the collection of Greek uh, classical literature. No, what was really necessary was to go back and finding Christ there, particularly in the Greek New Testament, to bring him back with us to apply to our own day. And so Melanchthon and Zwingli, though humanist scholars, were far more consistent in their reform than was Erasmus. For Melanchthon, it was Christ that was central and all the true reform of the church, the rediscovery of the biblical Christ would necessitate. And his humanism was more peripheral. Schaff continues, From that time on, he was a member of the theological faculty and delivered also theological lectures, especially on exegesis. He taught two or three hours every day a variety of topics, including ethics, logic, Greek and Hebrew grammar, he explained Homer, Plato, Plutarch, Titus, Matthew, Romans, the Psalms. In the latter period of his life, he devoted himself exclusively to sacred learning. He was never ordained and never ascended the pulpit. But for the benefit of foreign students who were ignorant of German, he delivered every Sunday in his lecture room a Latin sermon on the Gospels. He became at once and continued to be the most popular teacher in Wittenberg. He drew up the statutes of the university, which are regarded as a model. By his advice and example, the higher education in Germany was regulated. Melanchthon was powerfully influential in the field of education. As Robert Godfrey says, his reforming work on the school curriculum earned him the title in history of Preceptor Genini, the teacher of Germany. That brings us to the second sub-point, his, uh, his influence in the area of theology, and that's where we'll pick up next time.